Um, okay, so um, yeah, we're, we're here to talk about Bella City, which was a, uh, an ideas competition we won for the National Infrastructure Commission. It posed the problem, where do you put a million new homes on the Oxford to Cambridge corridor? Um, and we um, really started to look at villages because in the corridor there are thousands and thousands of villages. And I think that was a, a way of approaching it that we thought no one else would look at. Um, obviously there's new towns, urban, urban extensions, and actually villages are relatively untouched by planning. They're kind of preserved in aspect. aspect. So, um, and, and there are hundreds of them and they're dying effectively. So um, I think it, during lockdown, I, I feel that this idea has kind of potentially gained traction. I think first of all, people have accepted a really massive change to their lives. I was always told people won't accept change, but I think we have. Um, and I also think that people have started to kind of um, appreciate the benefits of, of moving slowly around places, walking, cycling, and their commu local community, local facilities. Um, and also, I think I personally have kind of, it's released me in a way. I realize I don't need to live where I work and I can actually work from home. And I think given the choice, I think a lot of people will be deciding to go and move out of the city into the countryside. Um, I'm, I'm on the board of the Quality of Life Foundation. We've done a survey um, asking people what they most value about where they live at the moment and the results have just come back. And one of the kind of key, key things is community, um, access to nature and, and local facilities and being able to walk and cycle safely. And so actually it's really important and those are the kind of, you know, the driving, the drivers for our idea. And we, we, we all met cycling on Padel, which is a, a kind of industry um, a cycle, big cycle ride, 300 miles in three days for women. And, and it's, so we are a collection of architects, um, planners and engineers, and we teamed up to tackle this, this challenge and look at whether we could introduce low speed networks alongside high speed. So this is the Oxford to Cambridge corridor. Um, and the, the pink line is the new high speed network. And if you kind of look across the whole corridor where, which was our site, you, it's, it's hundreds of villages. There are some key kind of urban settlements, but everything else is villages and they're all one or two miles apart from each other. We looked at Winslow, which we're just zooming in on, which was one of the proposed stops on the new high speed route. And we wanted to kind of find out what was there. So when you look at Winslow, the town cluster, it's got a, ta a little town at the middle, which is going to be the railway stop, but actually everything around it is villages and they are within a seven mile radius of the town centre, um, there were 20 villages. Seven miles because that's the cutoff point that people normally think is too far to cycle. So we looked at connecting these villages to Winslow and, and how to sensitively grow them. So we chose a village cluster to look what's there. We cycled around it, we went to talk to people. Um, the villages all have their own unique character but there are, they are close to the countryside. There's a feeling that they're close to the countryside. So the idea was to densify these villages, keep what was special about them and connect them with new routes. And we found looking at kind of maps and we found all these existing rights of way, which were actually the ancient roads that used to cross and they're not used. They're only really used by agricultural um, vehicles. So it was possible to connect all these villages through what we call the big back garden without necessarily having to, you know, buy up land or anything. There was existing, existing roads there. Um, then we looked at the villages themselves and said, well, what if you could actually um, densify these in a way that isn't what's happening at the moment, that you could actually put some relatively, I say high density, it's kind of medium density homes here um, and, and increase the population and so therefore bring back everything that's been lost, the buses, the schools, the shops, um, the pubs, which, are, which were all closed. I think there were two pubs in this village cluster and no schools. Um, so um, why villages? I think the um, congestion, well the, these were used, all the, all the country roads were used um, to cut through, there were no pavements, it would, it's very unsafe to walk or cycle there at the moment because cars just whiz down and there's not, because there's such old roads, they're not wide enough to have pavements alongside it. There were very ageing population, in one village there were no children, in another there were no teenagers and there were only small children because people had moved back to help their elderly parents. 
and they're completely car dependent because you know you wouldn't even drive from one you wouldn't walk from one end to the other because they don't feel safe and um they're very isolated you know there's that there's no doctor surgeries and all those kind of social aspects had kind of shut um which of course people mo moan about but the reality is there weren't enough people to support those services so our vision was kind of we distilled it into a few key ideas it's people over cars we're not saying get rid of cars we know that's unrealistic but we say what design around people and make cars visitors um and eventually over a 30 year time because this is a long a long term proposition we know that the car ownership will change and cars will gradually be replaced by i don't know automated electric vehicles who knows um connect them up so that they could start to share resources and keep the development compact not sprawl um make them resilient so think about them in the long term not just kind of short term gain of someone selling a field and to someone to build some homes on it um and opportunity of a decline i think that you know that they're being left i think it's it felt that it's too difficult to tackle villages but actually they could be viable great places to live again and particularly if they're only a 12 minute cycle ride to the nearest station so this was our you know our imagined village which is densified different uses more people living there shops open and you know eventually in 30 years deliveries will stop at the edge and it will be you know cars you know slow speed electric vehicles and people walking around them and they'll connect to the next village and and so that was the reality of the kind of distance cycling from to winslow the main train station you could get there from the furthest village in 22 minutes it would take you longer to get there by car and park so and it's a very um it's a very cyclable landscape around there um so this is at the moment what's happening is in each village has a planning application approved for about 12 homes and they are they are spreading out at a density of around 25 dwellings per hectare along existing roads because there's not a sufficient enough mass of housing to be able to put in any new infrastructure and the the villages are just joining up into a kind of suburban sprawl um and you and you can see the one on the right has actually that that was three villages that have joined up if you develop, we, we used 100 units per hectare because that was an easy number to deal with. But if you put higher density homes, at the same amount of accommodation is on the left as the right at, at a different density. So you you plan for villages. You don't just give um, planning up planning permission for like 12 units along an existing road. Um, so and that's the. Um, idea about really you know turning the center which we call the big back garden to a kind of productive place with community orchards locally grown food that could be distributed locally and um photovoltaics energy generation and actually leisure activities as well and revitalized woodlands we found old carp ponds to put back and and put it back to the kind of more of a mixed diverse landscape that it was because at the moment it's kind of a monocultural agriculture in that area um, then there was ideas about you know shared resources and keeping the character of places and and so you you know you might have sufficient people for a school in one village and you'd connect them up and then then some of them have have a former marketplaces within them and that could, they could be revitalized and um, so there's a kind of shared culture this something like this needs people on side and people involved in it. One of the other key things that came back in the quality of life um, uh, survey was people feel completely disconnected with decision making and that they don't count. And that's one of the main reasons that people feel very unhappy where they are. Um, we really need to find a way to get people involved in decision making about the place that they live. Um, and we talked to quite a lot of people and I they know with a the new they kind of know developments coming but they just said they just think it's going to be kind of sprawl all over the fields and I, it just doesn't need to be like that if it's actually planned so then we developed a, a code about you know how to how to design in a village and keep what was special and preserve views and um so so that's a bit complicated but we think we can massively increase the density of the villages in a way that doesn't impact on how you experience them and how they're used. Um, and we worked out that if we um, did all the villages that were just within seven miles of a of a of an existing or proposed public transport node, we could provide four hundred thousand homes just by 
um, each village has a few fields of development. Um, so that would all, that would kind of go some way to solving the problem in the Oxford to Cambridge corridor. I think that this is a kind of key bugbear really is what the kind of development that's happening at the moment. This is an aerial of a, a all I, I typed into Google, um, aerial view new housing. This was one of the first images come up. It's one of the, by one of the four big volume house builders. It's got the village look because everything's at a funny angle. Um, and so I kind of use this as an analysis of what a density of 25 dwellings per hectare actually means and what we are plastering around the country because 90% of new housing is not near a public transport node. So it's kind of this, this is happening everywhere. Um, on the ground, it doesn't look so bad, but on an area view, it allows us to really analyze what the space take up of this, which we've done rather crudely, but you know, I think it's quite accurate. So that, that's the footprint of the buildings, about 25 dwellings per hectare. Um, that's the green space. Some of it's back gardens, but a lot of it's just amorphous gaps between buildings because of their weird geometry against the road. And that's the tree. Um, these are the footpaths. So this is where as a pedestrian you can walk freely and safely without having to look out for a car. And this is where a car gets to move as fast as it wants without having to stop for anything. Um, and then if you look at the land take up, oh, that's everything else. The schools, the buses, the you know playgrounds, the communal facilities. Um, if you look at what that is, that's 40% is given up to roads and parking. Um, and I think what, we, what we're what we imagining is, you know, we had to go at making it a bit nicer. We kept the same housing, we, put, we made it a bit denser, um, and we just reimagined this as a place where you, you, you know, make the, the, the vehicular traffic so servant to the road, you connect places with, with, by walking and give pedestrians priority and you put other uses in. And so that's, you know, that, that's all possible. Um, and, and it would comply with everything. Everyone gets parking space, but it's on the street. Um, but getting this kind of development, anyone to do this is, is very extremely difficult. But, you know, we, we have to do something about the, the future of housing because these are completely car reliant places and they're gonna end up the ghost towns of the future. Um, over to Sarah. Stop sharing. So, um, so Annalise's given you a kind of introduction to kind of um, the proposition that we evolved probably about three years ago now when we won the NIC competition. Um, and this image is our kind of, we called it the uh, modern day picturesque. It was this kind of reimagining of the village of the 21st century. But the, um, but the competition for the National Infrastructure Commission uh, wasn't ever going to lead to a commission. Um, there was no money involved, so there was no project. Um, and it was really about gathering ideas and visualizations of what these places might look like with the sort of new fast uh, road and rail infrastructure. Um, and so, um, and so, we were all uh, feeling very impassioned um, as a group of, of people um, about uh, trying to make this happen. Um, and over the last couple of years, we've spoken widely. Um, we've spoken widely uh, at all levels. Um, we've had audiences with government, um, and we've spoken um, with residents and local communities. Uh, we also, um, in order to try and push this forward, um, applied for various research funds and were fortunate to receive um, research from the uh, research fund from the RIBA and we also won the William Sutton Prize for Social Housing, uh, which was its first year of incarnation set up by Clarion Housing. And both of these funds gave us a wonderful opportunity to develop aspects of our multi-layered strategy and to consolidate our thoughts and thinking. Uh, this led us to being able to produce um, a manifesto of our ideas, um, which we, we uh, exhibited at the Oslo Architecture Triennale at the end of last year. Uh, the theme was degrowth, very much in tune with what we're interested in, and the exhibition was called Enough. So it was about being more light-footed. Um, 
So ultimately our hope was to try and find partners and or landowners that we might be able to um, pilot our strategy with. Um, but of course this was not easy because uh, this is such a huge extensive uh, proposition. Um, however, um, we did it did finally lead to an introduction to Blenheim Estates, um, the owners of Blenheim Palace, um, who own a lot of land and villages around um, the palace. Uh, and that's what I will touch on um, in more detail a little bit further into the talk. Um, but in the meantime, um, leading up to that, uh, uh, we, we found the context in which we were sort of talking and working and developing our idea uh, was very much changing. And the, and the backdrop of um, climate change uh, uh, um, was bringing quite significant sort of uh, changes in, in what people wanted. And we were seeing quite big social uh, transformations. Uh, clearly, um, we you know we were living be we're living beyond the Earth's carrying capacity. There's huge loss of habitats, um, and in the UK alone, we've seen 50% uh, um, loss of species in the last 50 years as a result of urbanisation and uh, intensive agricultural practices. So I think last year it was the when the actions of Extinction Rebellion, Greta Thunberg, and David Attenborough really began to um, bring on quite a radical shift and uh, we saw real traction from people who um, were listening to what we were talking about in our proposition uh, um, and um, it gave us uh, uh, more of an audience I think um, uh, as people saw the importance of protecting our land and thinking about being more light-footed. Um, also, um, at the same time, we, um, oh, I think it's probably still on that slide, um, Rem Coolhouse uh, had, had, um, came along with a rather timely exhibition um, on the countryside, or you might say not, not so timely because he had to close it almost as soon as it opened because of the COVID. But nevertheless, there's, um, uh, there's plenty to read about it online, and I think it's interesting, we found it interesting that, you know, he, his premises is the countryside is being ignored uh, and that it's treated as a back of house support to urbanization and to cities. Um, um, but that said, um, I think he was uh, then you know, going on to kind of some of the political activism that's happened in the past. And this is something that when we were doing some of our research, we felt was important to understand the, the countryside has uh, uh, been party to a, a lot of polit political activism in the past. Uh, there's been radical changes played out, political uprisings in reaction to land enclosures, class divide, uh, workers' conditions, and all of these have brought new policies forward and ways of living in the countryside. Um, things like, well, the, and, and, and just the very attraction of fresh air and closeness to nature has seen in the past the new model villages um, in the countryside, such as the uh, garden villages, the Ebenezer garden villages. Um, bringing relief to um, industrial areas. Um, so whilst I think the um, Rem Coolhouse exhibition claims to be non-propositional and is a, is, is, is a collection of what we see right now, the current countryside condition, I think it does, um, I think they do argue that what we need is a more radical and creative way of rethinking the countryside um, in order to try and bridge this polarization that we have of those who want to keep the countryside as it is, wrapped up in aspic, uh, and those who want to ch change everything, clean the slates, start again, build new towns, etc. So I think um, I think our proposition um, is 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 looking to do that. It's looking to be more ambitious, more creative, um, and I think we called the title of this talk um, "Gentle Radicalism." Uh, and I think that's kind of what we were interested in. As Natalie said, what, what we, we picked on in the competition was we wanted to work with what's there, um, uh, what, you know, villages, existing places, um, uh, and, and in doing that to bring forward the need, the fundamental changes we need to planning policy uh, and land reforms, etc. Um, and so, uh, again, the question is, why is our vision needed now? That was a question that I asked on the previous slide as well, but it goes on to sort of probably echo some of the things um, Annalise said to a point, which is that 
There are huge social consequences of growth being concentrated in cities. We've got inequalities, social exclusions and breakdowns of social networks. We're experiencing increasing social and health inequality. One in three children leave primary school obese. Um, and for the first time since the Second World War, life expectancy has stalled. But COVID is, um, has kind of brought a lot of these issues uh, even more under the spotlight. Uh, and is, as Anna Lee has said, the survey work that Quality of Life Foundation has done highlights what people have really valued during the pandemic. Um, access to nature, walking, cycling, fresh air, access to community facilities and just better housing quality. So, um, so why the countryside? Well, I think for all the reasons I've just sort of talked about, but, but also obviously the growing pressure uh, on the countryside to provide more for homes. Uh, it's interesting that rural areas make up 85% of UK's land, but only 18% of UK population live in it. So there's 10,000 villages all in England, um, and they have the potential to support this, we believe. And as we've said before, many of them currently with car dependency are suffering in terms of um, uh, having any kind of community cohesion. Um, so we've already flagged up that villages need fresh thinking um, uh, if they are to support uh, new housing. And so over the last couple of years, some of the re research funding that we've been um, working with has enabled us to explore this further. Uh, the REBA research, um, uh, this is the front cover I think on the left, was allow allowed us to explore existing and, em and emerging models of rural densification. Uh, this allowed us um, to go and visit and study real places in the countryside, both here in the UK and abroad uh, in Europe. And uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, this was um, uh, our initial criteria to select case studies to visit was uh, to identify villages or rural settlements where there is a denser um, type of housing being built but not surprisingly there weren't that many um, and so our criteria extended to including case studies which had car free initiatives and approaches that involved communities in the decision making. We shortlisted this down to five case studies and they kind of fell into three types. Uh, the historic village, villages where uh, there perhaps was high density um, uh, due to the nature of the agricultural communities. We looked at new rural settlements which picked up places like Pambury and, and a curious village in, uh, called Jekreborg in Sweden. Um, and then we also looked at uh, slightly more suburban settlements because of this lack of rural um, uh, places like Marmalade Lane and Bayhuzin uh, in Copenhagen, both of which had really strong kind of um, community initiatives that were pushing for more um, sharing um, uh, ways of life. So, like I say, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, um, but Dent actually um, was um, uh, our example of an historic village up in Yorkshire, and it is, work, it is a bit of a standout for us. We absolutely love visiting this place. Uh, and unbeknown to us when we went, it had actually been visited by um, Ian Nairn in the 1970s as part of his BBC series across Britain. And it's extraordinary, really, because he was applauding the very same qualities that we were witnessing when we were there. And um, this is a, a super picturesque village, um, but it's very dense uh, uh, and, and compact. And uh, it's made up of lots of very simple terraced workers' cottages, has a hugely strong village community, I think, because everybody's walking and cycling. And the residents are absolutely adamant that no one brings their car into this little village. And so they, in fact, actually, when you see Ian Nairn's um, uh, footage, they are putting down the grass creek in the field outside the village for the cars to be parked on. And that was back in the 70s, uh, and it's still there today. Um, but I think it was also interesting because um, it, uh, it, uh, some of this, this research that we were doing around higher density housing in rural, rural villages and communities is, is quite a difficult thing to communicate. Perception is really quite a big issue. Uh, when you're talking about building more densely. Um, people see that idea of high density as being urbanising the countryside. Um, and yet here in Dent, you know, uh, it was a wonderful case study because it was considered to be super picturesque. It has tourism in, in, in the summertime, um, loads of people coming there because it's so pretty. And yet no one would be aware 
um, that, that, that would even begin to think that this was what they perceived as high density housing. Um, uh, and so one of the things we've learned is, is that we, we have to, um, that the quantitative assessments uh, uh, are not necessarily uh, equate to people's qualitative uh, assessment of a place and that language and the way we communicate our proposition is quite important so I think we've grappled quite a lot with what words we should use when we just, when we talk about building more higher density whether it should be more light footed or compact or I think as building better beautiful calls it soft density um, so out of this research um, uh, from the observations and the visits we did, we, 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 we began to pull together um, a set of emerging principles uh, which would guide us um, uh, towards ways in which we think you can grow villages differently. Uh, and this kind of operated at both the large and small scale. Large scale, we need to see changes in the current delivery and um, economics of housing market. Fundamental changes need to be made to planning policy in order to unlock previously undeveloped land in these villages. But at the smaller scale, uh, we look much more closely at these kind of place making principles, tapping into what's already there, um, you know, really drawing in on the local distinctiveness. And, um, and as, as Annalise said, sh looking at introducing sharing principles. Um, absolutely key that you can't just grow one village, you have to grow several villages in order, we think anyway, in order to bring back, bring back that critical mass to support all those shops, schools and villages that we've left, that we've lost. Um, and so just pulling out a couple of the uh, key principles that, some of the key principles that we pulled out here is, um, for example, uh, the first one, com compact village. It's interesting that in an urban condition, um, you might be looking to put big green spaces in the middle of a built up area, but in the countryside, it's very much about keeping the village compact and walkable and the big green space, if you like, is the countryside on the outside. We also saw dispersed, you know, moving away from the idea of the high street and all the retail and workspace being in one places, this idea of dispersing it seemed to work much better. And then topography was also key, working with that, having those soft edges uh, so that buildings um, sit in the, in the landscape, not on it. All these things were quite key and I mustn't go into too much detail because now, uh, I have no idea what the time is, but we need to move into um, what happened next um, when uh, we met Blenheim, Blenheim Estates. So Blenheim Estates um, were, um, well, are one of the landed estates who, um, between them, between all the landed estates, own over 30% of land in this country. Um, and I, I, I think I got that from Guy Shrubshall, who wrote that book, Who Owns England? How We Lost Our Green and Pleasant Land and How to Get It Back. Um, but that's quite a significant amount of land. Um, and um, we realised that uh, stewardship is really key uh, in order to try and implement um, any aspect of our strategy. So who owns the land uh, and how this land is managed has a huge impact on the delivery of, of affordable housing um, or the housing that we need and the way we grow our food and how much space we need to set aside um, for nature and the landscape. So Blenheim, um, I think it's 12,000, owns 12,000 acres. So they own the palace. Uh, there's a large park um, around it by Capability Brown. Uh, and then more land um, beyond that in and around uh, several villages that surround the palace. Um, Blenheim were introduced to us because I think, you know, they're aware that they have this sort of history of a kind of, you know, feudalism, which they wanted to break down these barriers and they wanted to um, reevaluate how they could look at creating a more shared vision of their estate with the local communities and how together they can um, yeah, create a more thriving environment. Um, and I think they were really keen to sort of try and look at how they can start using their land differently and how they can build housing more responsibly. Uh, so when they were introduced to us, there, um, there was very much a chiming, our vision very much chimed with their rethinking. Um, and um, uh, there are some major issues um, surrounding that area because of its proximity to Oxford um, and connections to London, um, uh, which Blenheim are often seen to be um, 
somewhat responsible for, which was which is huge traffic and congestion, both because of the tourism, but also um, because of new housing and also because people are trying to get to train stations in Oxford. So there's there's a number of key issues that we needed to that we that, that we realised um, uh, could be addressed by our strategy. Um, I um, when we first met them. Um, it was important to, um, they were very intrigued by what we were talking about, but they didn't necessarily see it being, didn't actually see the scale being applicable to them. It's really interesting how people don't really understand um, how far the next door village is from where they are or what is next door to them. Um, and so here we just did a, a quick um, comparison of the Blenheim cluster on the left. And this literally is the palace in the middle with these six or seven villages around the edge equated that to the village cluster that Annalise said we looked at around Winslow, or one of the village clusters around Winslow um, in the Oxcan cluster. And actually also just equate it to somewhere that everybody might know, which is Richmond Park, just to demonstrate that walkability and that, that proximity that all these villages have to each other, perhaps, but they don't really necessarily know it. Um, uh, particularly in the case of Blenheim, because it's situated in the middle with a two meter wall um, all around it. Um, so, uh, so this is just a map that kind of identifies, I think the pink is the land that um, Blenheim own, uh, the green in the middle is the park with the palace in the middle, and then there's, a, as I say, I think it's probably seven or eight villages that, that are located around it, uh, or with, the, you know, uh, the park itself is, is within a 15 minute walk from side to side, and then as you start going further out, this is all completely walkable and cyclable, um, you know, 15 minute cycle, Will, will pretty much take you from one village to, to, to the one side of the estate, um, to the palace to the other side. Um, so yes, we, we, um, we uh, pitched to them and they were very, very interested. And we then spent um, a lot of time uh, um, researching, uh, so both sort of in terms of um, stats, but also in terms of just spending time there cycling and talking and observing. Um, and um, drawing out potential issues um, and identifying future opportunities, uh, which we recorded in what we called a sketchbook. Um, so it's a very visual document. So I think whatever we do, we like to try and make it very visual. It's, it, it's a much easier way to communicate um, and it sort of you know, begins to sort of push things forward so much better. Um, and so the sketchbook, um, uh, records our sort of um, what we saw and opportunities that we felt could come out of that. There was um, issues around, the issues that we kind of probably identified even the competition were very prevalent here, the disconnect between villages, the sense of isolation, people not knowing what's even happening in the next door village, um, people not working together, people jumping in their car to get to the nearest train station, um, movement generally was really quite bad, pollution was bad, cars, uh, cars are sitting on the A40 and the A44 um, at rush hour time um, and uh, uh, shortcuts and rat runs through villages um, make it very dangerous for children and, um, and so what, what we were seeing was that if we carried on this way and we look at the sort of future local plans um, and if nothing changes, then the development was going to continue. We were seeing that development is going to continue around the towns and along the roads. Um, and, um, and this is obviously not the way that we think it should go. Um, and we then um, also recorded in the sketchbook uh, the sort of the sense of place, the village life, what was going, what was working there and what wasn't. Um, what the common issues are, um, village greens by being eroded by the car, um, a, you know, a, a, a poor mix of demographic, as, as, as Annalise said, um, uh, because there's not the right kind of housing. But also um, in recognising at the same time that um, each of these villages are quite different. They've grown and evolved around different activities. You know, there's a, there's a mining village around the, the stones fields. There's um, the market village, the estate village, the village that grew around a green, the village that grew around a church. 
Um, and it's really important, we think, that, um, that these distinct characters um, are safeguarded and, um, and any future proposals need to uh, understand this. Uh, uh, and um, we've, we've included studies of particular villages, uh, looking at the evolution of, of how they've grown around their landscape, their topography, um, what the village grain is, the different types of house typologies that we see there, historically predominantly the um, agricultural workers' cottages, and then more recently these more suburban style um, detached houses and estate housing. Um, but also large farms and farmyards often found in the middle of these villages also. Um, so, so to just, um, just sort of come back out of all of that again, our proposal to Blenheim um, was to, to um, try and resolve this disconnect uh, and, um, and link these villages. Uh, um, and quite literally the big back garden here is the Blenheim estate and the Blenheim, is, is the Blenheim Park. Um, and uh, just by opening up some of the rights of ways um, and um, old um, footpaths that do cross it uh, and some of the other ones that link the villages uh, around um, would, would shorten people's journeys enormously and, um, and make it much easier to get from school to train station either side of this park. Um, so, but also, but also to bring back the shops, the pubs, etc. We needed to grow these villages, um, and in some cases, as this diagram suggests, and it was potentially quite controversial, we may even suggest new villages, and that might be because we need a little bit more growth here to get the optimum population to support those to support the shops and schools, uh, so that people can just uh, go about their walking and cycling and slow travel on a daily their daily journeys can be done by walking and cycling to all these shops and um, workspaces but but also because sometimes the distances between villages uh, are, are, are quite windswept and long and we feel that perhaps that needs to be um, joined up a bit better um, so um, so that was a proposition that, uh, again, as Annalise said, isn't going to happen overnight. Introducing um, uh, new ways of travelling uh, by cycling and walking and decentivising the use of the private car will take time. Um, and so we've sort of set out a time scale of 20 years um, uh, and, and split that into sort of building foundations, the things you can start to do to put that in place, enabling the transition and then shifting gear. Um, and so this involves um, uh, trialling new cycle routes in and around the park, um, looking at co-mobility so that people can um, we introduce interchange hubs so that as you start entering into the village cluster you can downsize um, uh, into smaller vehicles or to shared slow speed electric vehicles so it isn't just about cycling and walking. Um, and you begin to slow down certain roads, um, remove, make it more difficult for the car to use those and deliveries and things begin to have a point, an entry point at which, as I say, we begin to downsize. And um, simultaneously we start, we, we, we see it's important to sort of identify places in the crisscrossing um, between villages where perhaps community pop-up events can occur um, perhaps there's a, it's, it's the beginning of a more permanent hub for um, working from home because again that's something that we're now seeing increasingly happen um, and, and just generally try to engage people in, in, in a discussion about how they can take more control over the changes that happen to this community um, and, um, and, and so that this has a, so that it, uh, so that they take ownership of this strategy as well there's a discussion and over time um, uh, these resources can become a more long-term uh, benefit um, and uh, yeah we've also beginning to experiment with um, uh, we're working um, we're beginning to experiment at what kind of new housing typologies might look like uh, what their cues might be we talked about the terrace cottages and the farm farmyard courtyards um, the terrace cottages do have a very high uh, high density um, and uh, we've started looking at, um, we, we're now starting to look at specific sites in some of the villages where we are beginning to cluster 
um, these terraced homes around these little courtyards. Um, and this is, this is um, looking at bringing smaller housing schemes into villages, maybe only 30 or 50 a year. Um, and it's looking at ways in which they can be more compact and can be less land hungry. And you can do this because if you can take the car out of the equation, less space is given to that, demonstrated by Annalise little um, uh, analysis. Um, also, there needs to be smaller units anyway um, for elderly and younger people. Also, we're, the concept of sharing also means we can have smaller gardens uh, and use the wider countryside. Um, and then also it has the opportunity of being able to work with smaller builders and not be so reliant on the big house builders. So this is a kind of picture, the shifting gear, where we might be in, in, in 20 years time. Um, we see a village cluster, this is the Blenheim village cluster, where it's virtually car free within its central core. Um, and um, as I say, said before, we have these interchange hubs, these yellow, these, um, well, they're the green rings where, uh, where uh, priorities people shift down to a slower speed and priorities given to people over the over car um, and then this this uh, this strategy which actually we've now started calling villages in a garden um, because it's a kind of rethink of the garden village but it's working with what's there already and it's working in a more dispersed way it's a series of villages um, villages in a garden connecting them um, and this, this is now getting real traction, it would seem, with the wider Oxfordshire area uh, and we've been encouraged, uh, ourselves and Blenheim, to put forward a strategy for the Oxford 2050 plan, which we're currently uh, um, uh, preparing. Um, and um, I think with the, um, I think that in this area particularly, they have there's a, there's a support partly just because they've just run out of land to develop on the edges of towns. Good and bad land has been used um, and, um, and they realise that you can't just keep building along roads um, because the roads don't have capacity. So I think there is real interest in, 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 in the way in which this can be supported. Um, we, um, we've aligned this idea of the villages in a garden to all the different um, positive attributes it's going to be, to, to bring um, and this just this kind of diagram looks at the benefits to the living and working uh, the connectivity climate and the environment and then how that relates to our five key principles people over cars compact not sprawl connected not isolated resilient not fragile and opportunity over decline uh, so where does this gen gentle radicalism, as we were calling it earlier, or what we called the talk, taking us next? Um, there really is huge traction, I think, being accelerated by the impact of COVID. Um, and that's not um, just because the countryside is attractive, because people can work more remotely and it, 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 it's, it's, it's a lovely, you know, it's fresh air and unpolluted. It's also, I think, what COVID has also suggested is, is that people's it is possible to change behavior quite quite quickly um uh, and so um and so the uh, hopefully there's a, you know there's an opportunity to build on that um having said that i think we're probably all slightly concerned with uh the government's build 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 um and the speed at which they want to do that uh and um i thought there was a really nice quote from naomi klein which was about how uh, we need to do this at a slower pace uh, and that and we found this ourselves when you slow down you can really feel things and this was something that you know just us going and cycling and walking around these areas you understand and you see and you meet and you're part of things much much more so um so i think also as she goes on to say the virus has forced us to think about the independencies and relationships um, uh, and that uh, we've been forced to think in more interconnected ways um, and this has kind of softened us and, 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 and brought more empathy. Uh, so I think we, we very much feel that this, this, is, this is the approach we're, you know, this, this is sort of aligns itself with the approach we're taking and it requires much more of a collective approach. Uh, and I suppose uh, we would very much, if, assuming I have gone on for too long, 8.16, we've got 15 minutes, sorry to try and just open up discussion and encourage um, 
your thoughts on this um, and um, whether you think this strategy could work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to stop your screen sharing. Thank you both of you. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, if you have questions for Sarah and Annalie, just um, pop them in the chat and I will direct them. Um, we have a question from Steve, but I'm just going to kick off quickly. Um, I think that I, I, was, I was finding it interesting, um, I guess, like right at the end when you're talking about this um, idea of, of post-COVID, there's going to be a lot more traction um, for this type of proposal when um, people's, the place where you work and live is kind of detaching. Um, but I guess if um, the, only the people that can work from home are the ones that are um, moving to these kind of more rural locations, does that create like more of a divide between the people who are left in cities and then the people who move to the, move to the countryside to kind of have the benefits of fresher air and should we be focusing too, I mean I know that we are, but on making cities greener as well? Of course. <laughs> but I think what's quite interesting is if people, if, if there are more people living in the countryside, there'll need to be more services. Um, and if you look at the census, we looked at the census re records for these villages, they used to have hundreds of people living there. Um, so yeah i mean it 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 will change maybe we we need to rethink the city as well i agree but certainly it will there'll be more jobs in the country won't there um but we weren't looking at the cities because you know i think cities are are a different a different proposition mm -hmm. um steve porter has a question steve i'm gonna unmute you Hi, um, it's really interesting um, talk and really, I think really relevant for me. I live in a small village in, um, in rural East Devon and what I find interesting is that we, we do have a couple of fields that you could turn over to uh, new dwellings, um, but I could honestly see I can't honestly see how you could sell that into the planners um, and the local residents. Uh, purely and simply from the point of view that there are certain demographics here that just that are very much focused on keeping everything as as you said uh, fixed in aspic for for time and memorial and and. Certainly, the planners, in my experience, are not, they're not particularly forward thinking. They want to focus all their development in certain areas. In Devon, we've had this massive development of Cranbrook, which I think is about 3,000 houses, which they like call Crime Brook, or at least the local papers do. Um, you know, it's, they're just not interested. They're just not interested in anything that is remotely interesting or forward thinking. Um, it's, they just want an easy life. They just want to dump it all in one spot, buy a big home, you know, a big house builder. And I'm sorry to I'm sort of have a big downer on your idea because it, it it it's lovely. I mean, all the the graphics are lovely, the ideas are lovely. You make it sound like somewhere I want to live, but I I I really struggle with it. And I and I I listen to what you're saying, and then and then I think about the reality, and I think it's. I just want you to do it. I want, I want you to be. Able, I want it to be easy for you to do, and I and I and I don't know how that happens. Well, I, th I think it's going to happen in some areas quicker than others, and it just so happens that um, uh, places like the Oxcam Corridor and now where we are with um, Blenheim, which is not so very far from that, there is an appetite for doing things differently, even down at you know at residents and villages. The congestion is so bad. Um, housing is just a given. There's more and more housing springing up in, the, in those areas um, and it's bringing with it more and more car, you know, car dependent um, people. Uh, so 
they they're not fighting development they just want i think people have got an appetite to um to do this differently there's got to be another way they know it's coming and how else can it be done um and up until now you know the house builders the big house builders have got a monopoly on this and um uh, they they don't have to be very imaginative and they can just roll out um you know their big developments uh as they always have done along these roads, invest in the roads and they get built out. And even now we're seeing Ancient, which is just at the south of the Blenheim cluster that we're looking at, is about to get a, a garden village, um, or at least, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's allegedly a garden, but, you know, it's, it's got principles of the garden village, but this is just really another big kind of uh, extension of a, of, of a village that's now become almost a town because it's blended, blurred with another village. Um, and uh, it's just, there's major concerns about how it's not really doing enough to create cycle and walking routes to the nearest train stations. And it is still, is going to be hugely car dependent. Um, so our conversations that we're having with people in, in that area uh, are actually really positive. And I'm sure places like Devon, it's, it's, it's gonna take longer, but again, you've still got some major problems there with the little lanes and, and the cars that use them. Um, I, I, I think, our, I think and you know, and I'm, I'm based in Wales, and I think, um, again, the nuances of these different places re will require slightly different approaches um, because uh, clusters don't always necessarily work in a nice little ring, and some of them are more linear and they go up valleys. Mm. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I think there's definitely an appetite for change. My view. Can I just say that when we, 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 this is three years ago we, we won the competition and we spent a long time going to meet councils, talking at conferences, being heckled and, and I think we, were, we realised that councils are dealing with m minute problems and there's no kind of, whilst they're invested in a place, there's, they're dealing, there's, there's no kind of holistic vision and it's easy just to give someone permission on a field that's far away from it's just the easy option um so we we got a bit kind of despondent and and then you know actually blenheim with this idea about long-term stewardship they see their their role ironically as a kind of legacy you know and and they there's there's a stewardship in the way that they they treat the, the development of their land and i think that's just a real shame that that's so rare to find people with any kind of long-term vision about about a piece of land it's very short term the way that land land speculation and sale happens um and we had some really in, um, interesting conversations with the volume house builders who said look by the time we buy the land there's 10 people speculated on it and it's really expensive and we have to build really cheaply um so yes i think I think if you know if we could do a kind of model and show that actually it's not really scary building relatively it's not even high density medium density homes um, and connecting them then I think hopefully other people will see that that's a model but we need to kind of crack the planning system as well I think the other thing to say is that you know all of all of the sites are near existing infrastructure they're all near railway stations that can get you to a place of work so they aren't really rural. I mean, they are, they're, they're earmarked for development. So you either get that, the, you know, the, the volume house builder approach or you, or you get to choose how to do it. Well, I hope you're able to convince, convince people fairly quickly. I mean, I do wonder whether or not the planners have got the skills to, you know, to sort of deal with this sort of scheme because it doesn't, you know, it, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's a very easy uh, path of least resistance just to give, you know, several hundred acres to somebody just to build out, you know, hundreds of houses and houses. I mean, the, you know, the majority of development here does, does revolve in a local, you know, in a local town, which, which does have a railway station. But, but again, it's, you know, there's not a lot of great, great amount of thought. It's given to Bovis and, you know, they do their stuff and, you know, I have to drive through and look at it. Um, great, I'm going to jump over because uh, Joanna has a question, well, a comment, if you wanted to say that. Joanna, you've got, you're have got unmuted. Okay, I, I know Lennon very well and went walking in it last weekend, so I'm was so excited to listen to your talk, which was just great. And I feel very op 
optimistic about this approach. And the thing I wanted to say is that um, I love it because it's a counterbalance to this quite terrifying um, insistence that we have to build terribly high densities in the middle of cities. We have to build skyscrapers. We have to build one after another, and I don't think we have any idea how to live in these things. Um, and I felt very powerless on design reviews and things like that um, in the face of this understandable need to build housing. And, but it's always assumed that it's got to be high rise and it's got to be in the middle of cities. So I just love this approach as a counterbalance to that. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I always think that height and density, though, is a product of, it's a kind of visual representation of land value. Yes. And there's a real problem with land being so valuable. Um, and how we crack it, I don't know, but I think it was quite eye-opening hearing about, you know, every time that there's a new railway plan, there's loads of people speculating land, buying up fields, the, the, the amount of times that land changes hands at increasing profit even in rural locations is quite shocking. Um, and I think that's where Blenheim are really interesting because that's, it, that's irrelevant for them. You know, they're, they're not, you know, they, they and, and they want to provide affordable homes for people to work, um, sorry, um, in, in it, where, where they, you know, in their estates. So that, yeah. that whole thing is taken out of the equation. It's like really refreshing. Um, Extraordinarily, I mean, I didn't know that Blenheim owned so much around their estate, and I didn't know they had this attitude. So they are, and they're a great find for you. You're a great find for one another in this circumstance. And um, I'm hoping that this period now um, is one in which people are rethinking all sorts of normal ways of doing things. Well, and I think it's, I think a lot of people don't realise that Blenheim are, you know, wanting to do things differently. And mm. it's only very recently that this has started happening, that they've really recently kind of really questioned the way they manage their land, the way they go about building houses, because they do build a lot of houses. They sell land and they build houses. Um, and, um, uh, and as Annalise says, they're in this extraordinary position where, they have got this stewardship, they have got this long-term uh, role. Um, and I think they're really, they're, we, we, the, the two or three key people that we're dealing with there are so forward thinking. Um, and it's interesting that they all, you know, all these landed estates actually share notes, speak to each other, meet regularly. So there's a, there's a real opportunity that 30% of our land could, could, you know, we could see some really, I mean, I'm being optimistic, but you know, that they're, there is there's an element of competition between them as well as to who can lead the way, who's got best practice, um, what works, what doesn't, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there really is potential, you know, for, 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 for quite big change here. I think um, they're a bit like Oxford and Cambridge colleges, aren't they, with a sort of long-term future in mind? Well, I think it's it, it does feel knowing that countryside well and knowing those villages. It, it feels doable and also just the effect that the new railway in a railway station in Oxford has had um, where again one feels that one feels a sort of hope about things happening out there mm. I mean they have really got to try and uh, invest more in the rails because okay we've got some you know there are some very good uh, fast connections to Oxford and, and, and Parkway, but um, there's actually a, a, at least two more lines that run literally through these clusters of villages. There's one that's going up to um, uh, Worcester, but they're just single track lines at the moment. Um, and so, uh, again, there is talk of investing and double tracking and etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, which will make a huge difference. People will, will yeah. not have to in their car to go to Parkway, they'll be able to walk or cycle to one of the smaller stations. Um,